Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Wayne Garvey, Chief Creative Officer of Sony. Um, um, uh, Sony. Uh, you've always been. Sony Pictures Television. Thank you, Magnus. And I had quite a lot to drink last night. And uh, welcome to. Now, before we start, actually, I should just say that this this session has got the worst one-line joke, which is all predicated, which is Kent and Allen's idea that I am a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a doctor of philosophy, so there is an appalling um, one joke running through this, which has nothing to do with Ben Winston, the producer, or myself. I just want you to be aware of that. Um, today's session is really about the independent sector, and it, it, the idea is that we want to give advice to people who are looking to sell up independent production companies, who have independent companies and wish to get bigger, who are just interested in the world of the independent producer. And we have an esteemed panel here today who can talk with their own experiences and give real in insight and meaning into this complicated world. On my right, I have Magnus Temple, who's the CEO of The Guardian. On my near right, I have James Baker, MD of Red Arrow Entertainment, and we'll be later on understanding why you were all walking around with Red Arrow on our cards. <laughs> on my left, I have Tom Mannering, who is MD Corporate Finance at MediaTek. And on my far left, I have a man who I have never met before <laughs> called Andy Harris, who by some sheer coincidence, uh, yesterday it was announced his company has been bought by Sony Pictures Television, and I'm sure we'll be talking. If we had known that when we were organising the session, we probably would have done it all a lot different. Um, so, uh, as I say, we have a theme in, in this, which is a kind of medical theme, and we have uh, asked independent producers for the pertinent questions in their lives, and uh, consequently, we have a number of um, letters which have been sent in to us. And can we have the first one on, please? Yes, see what I mean? It's a very, very weak gag. <laughs> and the fact that none of you laughed just underlines the fact it's an extraordinarily weak gag. So this is a picture of a young man who he was sent in. He's an independent producer. And his question is, dear Wayne, I like to swing both ways. I like a little factual. I like a little entertainment. Can a guy have it both ways? I.e., what should an independent production company be looking for? Should you specialise? Uh, should you just be a drama production company? What do you do? You know, is, is that important? So I'm going to kick off Magnus. What do you think? Um, should he have it both ways? Yeah, I mean, of course you can have it both ways. I mean, I suppose in our, our experience, um, we do specialise. I mean, we obviously specialise in factual, and we specialise in a kind of particular kind of factual, and we got known for doing this multi-camera rig stuff. Um, but I think that as you grow bigger, I think your reliance upon one genre um, can become more problematic. I suppose one thing I do feel really strongly about, because both in uh, running Firefly, Dragonfly and The Garden, is that there were always times where uh, we were tempted, I think, to um, reach out and, and perhaps reach out a little bit too far, because we all sort of know that this business is built upon really strong relationships. Um, and all of the ideas, all of our successful programmes have always come um, out of a kind of collaboration with, the, with particular commissioners, particular broadcasters. Um, so I think that's really, really important. I think you don't want to spread yourself too thin, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, and I also think it's really, really important that people know what you're about. You know, they know what you are. I think that if people go, the garden... Um, or they go left bank, that they know what they're, they sort of know what they're getting. And so I think the, the, the brand is important. Whatever you do, it needs to sort of represent something about what, what you are, if you see what I mean. And Andy, presumably left bank, the, the, the name and everything, that brand when you sell the company is very, very important to you. I think, I think uh, personally, I think uh, Marcus is absolutely right. I think focus is very important. Branding is, 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 is absolutely key. And I think you have to stick to that. We, Mario and I, who's in the audience, um, uh, considered opening an entertainment <coughs> division about two years ago and found some interesting people to do it, raised a bit of money, thought long and hard about it, and then in the end backed off it. And I, I, it was a good decision, I think, in the end, because just even thinking about uh, opening up <coughs> another wing at the time when the drama and the comedy were still really rocking, I think it was, taking, it was, it was just drawing us off the, off the main game. I, I think, so yeah, I think it's, my, my advice is to be clear about what, about what, what, your, uh, what, what your brand is and what your image is, what you're selling and where your best contacts are. If you're selling shows, you've got to know those people, they've got to know you, they've got to know you're going to deliver. And if you're moving into an area where your contacts are less good, you're going to have a lot greater problems. They're not going to trust you. 
so much, and, and trust is, is everything in this game. And, and James, when, you, when you're looking for acquisition targets, both internationally and in the UK, do you, do you, does this all follow through on this? Yeah, I think it, it helps because um, you know, when we're looking to build a portfolio of partner companies, I think we're looking to get some real balance in the group of companies, and I think it, it becomes difficult if you've got a company that spreads itself very widely. And it, to be honest, with smaller companies, which has been our tendencies to look at younger and, and smaller companies, is they are going to be more focused. It's only when companies grow and mature that they really broaden out and take on other genres. The one thing I would say is that a lot of this is driven by opportunity. If you come across a particular piece of talent or an opportunity to do a show, I think it's very difficult to say no if someone says, well, it's a fantastic opportunity to do something that's outside of your speciality. I think you can get drawn into doing that. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think you'd learn a lot by doing it, and I don't think it's necessarily a disaster. I think that's the same whether it's geographical or by genre or by platform. I think you need to go and experiment and try new things. And, and, and Tom, Elizabeth mm -hmm. Murdoch last night when she talked about the independent sector um, and, and was also talking about the, the challenge of digital. When, mm -hmm. when you're looking to uh, give companies advice in, in the process of selling, how important now is that sort of not so much being a linear TV uh, company into the digital uh, important? I think certainly having an eye to that area is important, although I think most of the profits and revenues in this business still comes from, from conventional linear TV. Um, but I'm not sure that will be the case in 10 years' time, so um, quite how best to approach that area. I don't think anyone's entirely sure, but um, certainly it's, it's some companies have been successful in, in the new media area and looking at that particular particular division. Okay, well, we're going to have a look at a case study now. Um, I, I told you this was a very tenuous uh, thing. Can we, can we have a look at our first <coughs> case study, which is our, our, <coughs> our good friend, uh, Magnus Temple. And there you are, Dick, Dr. Fowl in, in uh, relatively uh, scrabby uh, doctor's handwriting. Magnus, your b background was that you were a producer, director, work, working on a range of mostly factual, factual programs. Yeah. And then in 2010, <coughs> you founded, um, sorry, in, in, in 2004, you founded Firefly, mm -hmm. which then renamed Dragonfly. Can we just go on to the, 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 the healthy section here? Um, you set that up in, with Nick Cohen in 2004. You sold to Shine in 2007. Then you left Shine and Dragonfly, and you set up The Garden in 2010. Can you just t tell us the process? Of how, I mean, in a very, very <coughs> uh, short... Uh, OK, <laughs> I'll try and be brief. Um, so, I, uh, as Wayne said, I was a, um, uh, I was just a freelance producer, director, and then um, <coughs> I was a series producer for, for a short while. I'd always quite liked the sort of, uh, sort of entrepreneurial nature. I always used to have little projects on the side, do a couple of corporates, and sort of do it within my own little company. And um, I also sort of identified that actually just really as a freelance producer director, it was at the time I just started, started a, a family. And in the end, I thought it was probably going to be a good idea to sort of own the means of production in some, some way, <laughs> because I couldn't really see how it was going to work out in the long term. So, um, uh, and uh, I was working with Nick um, Kerwin at the time. Uh, we were both working on, at Mentorn. Um, and I and that, that relationship was very important. You, you, yeah, pair we, of you we, thought. We, what, what had happened is, is that we'd worked on a couple of series together and it really worked. It was a really good um, relationship. Uh, he was on staff at Mentorn at the time and I think that um, it was just the, the timing was right because I'd mentioned it to him but I'd sort of been thinking about you know, maybe in a year or so or two years um, and uh, I think for him the timing was right then. So I remember him saying to me, calling up and saying, if I said, um, do you want to do it now, would you do it? And I said, absolutely. And also, because I was a freelancer, I'd never had that security. So in some ways, it didn't feel like very much of a leap. Yeah. So we put, we stuck in five grand each uh, and <coughs> got a commission up and running that I directed. Um, and we, so we, we, we started so small um, and with so few overheads that in a way um, it grew incredibly organically. There was no kind of big setup cost at all. And, and in a way, when we did it with the garden, we did it in exactly the same way. A little bit more money we put in, but not very much more. Um, and I know there's all sorts of different ways you can do it. You can do it with investment. But for us, it really suited us that we only grew at the kind of pace of the revenue that we brought in. Um, and of course, you know, then there are challenges that, that, that lie with growing and there are in, inevitably 
um, growth pains. And I think that um, you know, part of the reason that we, we uh, uh, sold to Shine is that the company was growing very rapidly, and we were quite inexperienced, I'd say. Um, <coughs> and it felt like a very sort of secure home to kind of birth the company into at that point. Um, and, and it was a good home, actually. Yeah. How important was it that it was a partnership? I was interested that, actually, just thinking about it, it's amazing how many people, when they're uh, setting up Indies, build really strong yeah. partnerships with, in your case, uh, with Nick and, and Andy with the companies case. that we've done. It's, it's these strong partnerships yeah. that uh, really help yeah, a company. Yeah, I, uh, 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 I sort of think quite a lot about that, actually. I think it's absolutely critical. Obviously, everyone does it in a different way, but, it, but that, that relationship, that partnership, because you have so much... Uh, to experience and to learn and to and to share uh, with each other, I think I'd find it quite lonely and probably more frightening to do it on my own for sure. Um, and obviously, it means that you have to uh, you, you have to compromise a bit when you're in a partnership. You can't have it all your own way. Um, but uh, but but it really worked, and we re the two of us really complement each other. We're quite different mm. sorts of um, characters, and we've we've. But we found within certain programming that we do that actually what we both bring really, really works. I mean, certainly, Andy, w when you set up Left Bank, it was very much a partnership with Mariko Kehoe, who was your head of production. Yeah, there was. I mean, we were working together at Granada, so we had about four or five years running. And uh, amazingly, she tolerated my lunacy. And, and I, you know, I needed somebody who was completely rooted, completely focused, and would laugh at my jokes, basically. <laughs> so... Uh, so it worked brilliantly. So she shared the, the same ambition as I to get out of Granada and, and give it, give it. You know, we sensed the time was right, and we wanted to. I was a little bit different from, from Max. We wanted to um, uh, start quite big, but with so we, we took an investment, but we had a very small team. But we set up uh, our production, <coughs> our finance immediately, so we were sort of ready to go into production, even though we weren't in production. We didn't have any commissions when we set up, but we were ready to go as soon as we got a commission. So. Uh, I think as a scripted company, you really got to be sort of sit for us. We really wanted to be sort of you know joined at a high level immediately, or at least perceivably so. Anyway, I mean it was all perception, isn't it? It was all proving sort of bullshit, really. But but uh, but you, you know, mm. and uh, this partnership thing that again that that helps when you're. Yeah, I think I think it's important for the key creative talent to be bound in with the equity ownership in the company because that's what our purchase is ultimately buying. So I, I think having a more broadly focused creative team rather than just one individual is, is, is certainly helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, Magnus, you, you, you've done it once and then you've done it again. Yeah. So what was the key learnings from...? Uh, I mean, we've, we've learned a huge amount, actually. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting because actually, uh, when, we, when we set up again, we didn't, we didn't aim to be where we are now. And I know it's only two years ago. Um, uh, we, we, we set up <laughs> specifically to be quite um, bespoke um, uh, quite a boutique, um, and I think really, probably off the back of the success of 24 Hours in a &E, um, uh, the company's grown much more rapidly than that. But I think that we've done, we have done things quite differently. Um, it's much less reliant upon the two of us. Uh, we've built a really good team. Uh, we've got a fantastic managing director, creative director, and a sort of team of execs. Um, so it feels like actually, whereas last time the growth at times felt a little out of control yeah. and you were sort of you just wanting to kind of hang on to and make sure it was okay um, this time it feels I think we're much much more strategic and I think that one thing I really really learned is how important a very few titles can be um, and I think that you know when you're choosing to do anything any project you know what t TV is incredibly hard work any project is, is, can be a real um, ball ache so I think that whereas last time round, we sort of just grabbed the opportunities as they came, I think when we, we take much more care about what we do and what we decide to do. Um, uh, and also, we're, we're, we're more, I think we're more commercially aware um, of the importance of certain, a certain number of things rather than sort of just trying to do everything. Yeah, because that is a big problem. If you're a small company, you want to go out and grab those, those commissions. And then, of course, they... they a small program takes up sometimes as much time totally. as a big, and, and, and within development, are you now much more focused on one or two I mean, bigger projects, or? I, I, I'd say for us, the, 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 the kind of mixed ecology approach is really right. I mean, I sort of feel, um, if you sort of imagine a shop window of the garden, I like the fact that we have quirky one-offs and, and a bit of that and a bit of that. Um, 
but it's important to limit how much of the how, you know how much of your focus is taken away from the one or two things that are going to make a difference. Okay. And so I think we are um, certainly in looking ahead in development. We know that we always need one or two things that are going to make a difference two or three years down the line. But that's not to say that we won't continue to do all of the other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, we have a, a quick diagnosis. You, you, you'll be glad to know that the, the diagnosis is you've, you've combined innovation, critical acclaim, and rating success in blockbuster documentary brands. Um, your potential concerns are that is, can the company continue its rapid growth and maintain the quality? And, mm -hmm. that, and that is a real problem with, with independence, isn't it? How do you maintain that, that quality of success? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I suppose also the other thing is, is that if you look at um, returning series like 24 Hours and E&E, and it was only right really at the end of our Dragonfly era that we actually started to have kind of returning brands. Um, and of course, each time you do something, it's maybe a little bit easier because you've done it before, but the amount of work and effort, um, but also talent that has to go into a series like 24 Hours and A&E every time you do it um, is enormous. So um, it is, you do need really committed and fantastic teams who are kind of, who, who keep being motivated. <laughs> um, and I suppose that does get harder if you're doing something, if you're doing something for the fifth or sixth time, yeah. let's say. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I think it's all about, for us, it's all about, um, I suppose, having a team on board that can sort of take on some of that, but also having a relationship with that team rather than just kind of hiring people a bit randomly. That most of the team are all people that we've had existing working relationships mm. with. Okay, let, let's go on to our, our second <coughs> letter from an independent producer. Uh, dear Wayne, I went on holiday to California and I picked up something nasty. Isn't agent really necessary? <coughs> so um, th this really goes to the, the core of many questions, uh, which is what do you do in America? America, the Holy Grail. And why do all these people from WME, CAA, ICM, etc., etc., come and bother me? Andy, have you had any experience? Well, they're probably all in the audience. They, they probably careful, are, what actually. Say. Yeah. Probably. Uh, well, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's fact. You can't work in America uh, without an agent. Uh, really, and so you, you, it's it's a it's a necessary part of the business there, and it's an accepted part of the business. And um, uh, the difficulty really is trying to work out who's the right company. Uh, and the other difficulty, I guess, is to whether you just kind of try and flirt a bit with all of them, uh, which is what most of us really do, uh, rather than sign with any of them. Um, not that signing with it is, is problematic, but it, you know, it just it's sometimes it, it, you want more freedom. It's very, very tricky. I mean, they are they are very, very good. They understand the business in America. They control the business essentially in America. So um, it's just it's a very different system from the UK. So it's just something you have to get used to, and you just have to try <coughs> to find the right company or the right agent to look after you and hope that you're going to be in a good place. And, and James, do you, do you have an overall agency deal, or do individual companies have relationships, or what? No. We we don't. I mean, we're lucky in a way because we've been able to invest in um, three companies in the States who provide a really good uh, opportunity for all the companies to engage with networks. And none of our companies have got um, specific representation. I, I, I think if it's possible and you've got the ability to do it, it's great to be able to put someone in L.A. to help you full time. And I think that can help you not get sucked into an exclusive <coughs> agency deal. But then again, uh, trying to keep up with all of the networks, all of the talent, uh, the whole side of it, it is next to impossible. So, you know, I think, as with Andy, I think it's in an ideal world, you sort of flirt with all of them and pick the right project for the right agent yeah. partner who can drive it forward. And on the bigger issue of, of, of America, Magnus, how, how important to you when, you when you look at how you're going to grow the company is, is to establish a relationship and a footprint perhaps even in the US? Uh, um, I love the idea of a New York office, but maybe that's just because I like the idea sure. of it. <laughs> uh, I think America is, is obviously important, and I suppose um, we don't have an office and don't have any immediate plans to have an office, but I think would be interested. We've got, uh, we've got one project that is being um, produced in America, but um, in, uh, um, it's through a sort of collaboration with ITV Studios. Um, and in some ways, that's quite an interesting learning process because we've been quite involved in the production. Um, and so I think that once you sort of try to understand the mechanics of it, 
um, I think that we, we would be potentially interested in, in producing there. Um, but certainly, I think we very much have an eye in terms of what we're developing here on, you know, on brands and titles that can potentially travel and be remade. And obviously, America is one of the biggest markets. And, and we have, um, on a specific project, have one agent representing that, and that's worked really well. Um, but I think we are considering whether we have a kind of um, a specific relationship with one agent across the board. Um, and I suppose that's partly just a kind of, t partly a sort of time management thing, um, because on both sides in a way. I mean, if you've got a slate of projects and you're able to discuss them with one individual as opposed to half a dozen, um, then that, that seems to make sense. But I suppose in choosing your agent, I, I, for me, it's all about personality. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's a massive amount of difference in the different, whether you go with CAA um, or UTA or um, um, whatever they're called, but they're not called William Morris anymore. WME. WME. Um, uh, but I do think it's really important that you, you, f you find that you have a common understanding of the individual. Because we've had lots of experiences in the past where you just get on the phone and, and they, sound, they, they say, oh, everything you're doing is absolutely marvellous and we're going to pitch <laughs> it to all of these million channels. And you're just like, that's just bullshit, you know. So you want, to, you want a relationship that's a real relationship. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, there's start, Tom, Tom, I mean, I know from my own experience, the start-up costs of of a standalone operation in the US are, are huge and, and it can take the focus off. If you've got a UK company, mm -hmm. focus off. So what, what advice to you as somebody who, who works to bring investment into companies about the American opportunity? I mean, I think, I think America is very important for, for UK indies because the market is, is so much bigger than the UK and there are a huge number of channels there commissioning original content. So I think you can grow much faster your primary commissions in the States than you, you probably can do in the, in the UK. But there is a level of, element of risk and investment required to get there. Uh, and a number of organic, organically, a number of Indies have done that themselves, but that has often required the CEO of the business to go over to the States and position themselves in LA to make it happen. Um, obviously, probably our lower risk uh, approach is, is if you're umbrella by a bigger group, obviously Left Bank and now with you at, at Sony, you're going to umbrella them into the US, which is probably a lower risk approach to attack that marketplace. Mm -hmm. A number of other companies do that as well. So I think the US is very important, and I think. The ideal scenario, given the right situation in the UK, is to take your UK rights to the US so that you already have that, that primary format position in the UK. I think finding a like-minded production company that's similar to you, it's certainly non-scripted, I think, finding a company that's similar to you in the States and building a partnership with them is a really good way of getting going. I think if you've got great ideas that are working in the UK, you want to explore the States, I think finding someone who can really help you do that so that you have active involvement in the creative process, but you're not having to do jump through all of the hoops that you really have to jump through to make it a success. I think mm. that's a good starting point. I think things like Real Screen have really been interesting. I think those who went to Real Screen last year, it, it, it's a, it, for the first time, I think it's a really good forum for producers to get together with cable networks and with other producers. And I can see that becoming quite an important market as an entry point for non-US companies to come in. Um, we, we're going to take our <coughs> next letter. <coughs> which uh, is, uh, dear Wayne, my assets are great, how can I maximise them? Which uh, really, I guess, is a question about distribution. Um, um, is it, is we're it? getting a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is quite amazing. Um, it's really, these days, it's all about distribution, isn't it, James? Uh, it's very helpful. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think if you look at the, you know, the uh, margins that you get out of a, uh, just a straight commission versus the benefits you can gain from distributing products successfully internationally, it, it's, it is the thing that's going to completely uh, change your company and, and give it a huge boost forward. So finding the right distribution partner, uh, I think, is an absolutely key thing. And actually, and I'm sure everyone will, will, will have their own experiences, but it's actually very difficult to find that right partner. And the, the chemistry's got to work, and most of all, I think you've got to find a partner who really cares about your product and is actually going to properly push it. Similar to agents, a lot of distribution companies will tell you they love you deeply and they love all your stuff and then you'll go to market and see that it's tucked behind the three other projects. So finding the right distribution partner who can help drive your product forward is absolutely key. Um, and I think, you know, the choice actually isn't that huge um, and you want to go with someone who's big enough to make a real impact and has got the contacts. 
but at the same time, you're then facing the fact that your project is going to be in with you know a good few other ones from other companies, and it's how to find that balance. So, um, I mean, so uh, Andy, you you were with BBC Worldwide, you're distributing yeah. that. You're only going to be moving to Sony. I yeah. mean, that must have been a key decision. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, when 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 we set the company up, we we we, we, we thought about the company to set it up. What we recognised was that the we thought that what was missing <coughs> in the drama companies at the time, which was a QDOS company, Carnival, was a focus on international. And we had done at Granada, you know, Dr. Vargo, Prime Suspect, The Queen, and various things like that. So we, Marigo and I, loved uh, basically getting on planes, actually, to be truthful, uh, and meeting people. We thought that was a real something that was kind of wasn't wasn't <coughs> uh, wasn't really being developed. And we were a little tired of going to America too, so we thought concentrate on Europe. So that was Left Banks was coming in international programming with the European accents, so hence Wallander and Zen and all that kind of stuff. And it was, you know, it worked, which was lucky. So the distributor was key. BBC Worldwide, as you know, because you gave us the money, was a, was a brilliant choice because you know we knew we had a production company. What we needed was a distribution company. I mean, it was it was as simple as that. And moving forward with Sony. Again, you know, as we sat and thought about what we were going to do with Left Bank, we got to a point where we thought, you know, we're growing fast, we're doing well, but, you know, we're in the international game. How are we going to kind of maximise it? If we maximise the assets, if we want to use the thing. It, it was really partly, mostly really about finding a company that was understood what we were about and could take us, take us on. And Sony has got an extremely good distribution arm. And, I mean, and Tom, when you look at a company that's ready to come to market, the... the, the the background on the distribution rights is really mm -hmm. crucial, isn't it? And, and some companies have a, have a smorgasbord of distribution mm -hmm. relationships. Some have one key relationship. How do you manage your way through that? I, I think rights is key, for, particularly for UK companies. I think, I think sometimes people forget how attractive the environment is in the UK for rights. Now, clearly, from a purchase perspective, they would very much like to have those rights unencumbered and be able to push them through their own in-house distribution team. Um, because if you get a successful UK format that can be sold internationally, those kind of profits can, can almost... You know, put the profits of the individual company into sort of into, into significance. Um, so I think what's attractive from a selling perspective is that, that you, it's difficult to have a long-term output or distribution deal because ideally the purchaser going to terminate that deal and take on your new product going forward uh, and put that through in, in, internally because that's where they can maximise most value. Okay, I, I'm going to come on to the uh, case study that is James Baker now. Um, and, and James, you, you're... Your history is you started as a tea boy at uh, Breakfast TV, which I know you're very proud of, and then you had a long-term relationship with Sky, etc. And then recently you've you, you moved firstly into the private equity world in 2007, and now you're joint managing director for Red Arrow UK. And I, I think it'd be quite interesting, actually. We've seen, as, as I said earlier, Red Arrow on here about a year ago. If you'd said Red Arrow, very few people knew what Red Arrow was or was doing, and now suddenly you've got a huge profile at this conference. Could you tell us a little bit about Red Arrow and what your strategy is? Yeah, I mean, we, we're part of the ProSieve and Satellites group um, who own a, a number of free TV networks in Europe. And they made a decision that they wanted to be in the content business as well. Um, so when we got talking about it, I think we all felt that cyclically it was a very good time to invest not in very big production companies, which... Um, may potentially have lost their edge or be losing talent, but to find companies who had very strong creative uh, drive but didn't necessarily have the support that they needed to grow <coughs> beyond a certain point. And I think, um, in a way, we were lucky because uh, I think we came into the market at a time when there were a couple of companies that we felt were really outstanding um, internationally, but specifically in the UK, and we were very lucky to be able to invest in CPL because I think, you know, Dan and Murray at CPL are a perfect example of how a great partnership works. Um, they had fantastic relationships in the industry and I think it gave us an enormous step up to get going in the UK. And it's allowed us just to build, to me, a really interesting little group of companies who um, are great on their own, but more importantly, they work together very well. And I think we're trying to focus as much as possible on getting the 18 companies now in the Red Arrow group, to work as closely as they can together. I think if you go beyond a certain number, then it gets really tricky to manage the ecosystem within the group. And I think, <coughs> you, you know, what we're aiming to do, I think certainly over the next year or so with those 18 companies, is to concentrate now on helping them grow, helping them build uh, their relationships and their profiles internationally and work together. And I think, you know, 
things like supporting Edinburgh, I think, actually has been a huge uh, boon for us. I think it's been very easy to, 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 to get our names on everybody's uh, <laughs> um, uh, labels. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's been really encouraging how, you know, people have responded to us, and I think it's... Uh, you know, it's a starting point, but I think we're really happy with the size of the group. But, 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 it, but it's interesting, you, you, you've, you've absolutely strategically said, actually, we're not probably interested in, in companies that reach a certain size. We're interested in growth and presumably uh, helping them develop ideas and then maximising the, the possibilities of their intellectual property. Yeah, I, I think we try and keep it as simple as possible. We want to allow the companies that we've invested in to do what they do best, which is to go out and create great shows our job should be to help get those shows out internationally, distribute them, find good partners, and also help them with the kind of back office stuff, which in a lot of cases drags production companies of a certain size down so, so far. I think they spend so much time worrying about legal and business affairs and operations that it takes their off the ball. So I think what we're trying to aim to do is to take the boring stuff away from them and allow them to concentrate on getting on with their jobs. And Elizabeth last night when she talked about independence was, was almost sort of saying... Uh, actually, it's not independence really isn't about the ownership. It's more of a state of mind, really. And I was wondering, have you? I don't know if you have done uh, any sort of startups. Would, would you look to take uh, talent out of existing independent production companies or, or in-house companies and and set them up? Is, is that something that I think the closest we've come to startups is working uh, with companies who I think have got themselves going and have proved themselves, but need that push to get to the next stage and we invested in a company called Nerd uh, here in the UK who embodied that exactly. They've been going you know, just for 18 months or so and uh, been initially supported by Charlie Parsons and had huge talent and, and they're you know, great guys to work with, great to work in the group but they were an obvious company for us to invest in because we could take them naturally to the next stage and get them out into the market and in a very short amount of time they've had a, a really good impact not just in the UK but actually in the US as well. So, you know, that's a really good example of, I think, us investing in early stage companies. <coughs> I think startups, I think, as I said, for the moment, we've probably done what we're going to do yeah. and we're going to concentrate on what we've got. I think startup possibly a little bit too early for us. Okay. Now, now the, the diagnosis is that, are you healthy? Um, what, what, what our doctor's notes say, it's very interesting. You've got that uh, Sky Broadcasting background, you've got production background, you've got the private equity sector, and of course also working with a German company with investment experience. It, it, it's quite an in interesting mix, actually. And the diagnosis, by the way, is that uh, it's great, frankly. I mean, I can't be bothered to read it any further, actually. I mean, you, you're, what, a, what a wonderful human being you are. I and, 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 and I, I think we should go straight on to our next uh, letter, because this is quite pertinent. Um, Dear Wayne, older men keep hitting on me in Soho House. If I get into bed with them, will they make me rich? Oh, well, that... Andy, is this I happening mean, to you I knew recently? It's always such a I didn't, I didn't come up with this. Yeah, I mean, I don't like... I like oh, no, it. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I know, well... Whatever. This is really all about the fact that Wayne and I are staying in a house together where there are four of us in three bedrooms, and I was the last one in, but the first to arrive. So naturally, I took the first and biggest bedroom I could find. And Wayne finds himself sharing with a, someone he wasn't expected to share with. He's a very lovely man who's in this room, and, and, <laughs> and we're coming out later. So, um, they, they so we were both rather desperately attempting to try and find farm one. Or one, one yeah, no, Andy, that isn't what it's about at all. Andy. <laughs> it's about you recently sold your company, so let's cut the crap jokes and let's get to the point that the audience wish to know, I, I think, audience. So you, you've sold your company? Yeah, I, I have, yes. So why? What, oh, why? Oh, why? Well, well, I mean, why? <laughs> Mars, why do we sell? <laughs> well, I, 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 oh, let's go back. Well, first of all, we didn't set it up to sell it. I mean, we didn't set it up thinking, oh, well, in five years' time, we'll make ourselves a couple of bob and that will be great. We set it up because we wanted, we wanted to be freed from what we felt at the time was an uninterested a management at, at ITV or Granada, as it was then, which were uninterested in in-house production, strange though it may seem today, but they weren't. And, and, and we, there was a certain type of things we wanted to produce, and we felt, there was, as, as I, said, I mentioned, there was a gap in the market for international programming. And I suppose concentrating on international programming and concentrating uh, on long-running series immediately, that was the other thing. We decided not to do two parts and singles. We, did, we actually had a policy of not even looking or thinking about them. We didn't develop anything that was like that at all. We only concentrated on series because it was clear that if you were going to, you know, if you were going to go into the international business, you, longevity was, was, it, was inevitable. So 
I suppose the truth is we've had good fortune. We've, uh, we, you, you know, I think a lot of this game is luck. You have to be in the right place at the right time for all sorts of things. You may well be walking into the commissioner one day, as I was, as I've told this story a few times, on strike back, you know, Sky at that time, which was three years ago, <coughs> had really had never had any money for drama. And I went to see Elaine Pike, who was head of drama at the time, and I went in and I had a book which I bought at an airport, which I truthfully hadn't read, but, you know, and we got into a conversation and I pitched this idea called Strike Back as an action series, which she bought on the spot. And, I, and, I, and as she said to me, well, tell me the story, I said, you don't want to know about the story, just trust me, it's all. <laughs> I actually didn't have the rights either, but I, I don't know. I'm not suggesting, by the way, this is necessarily the way to go, but this is where the luck comes in. Uh, and so this particular moment uh, and this particular book, which I bought, you know, by chance and not read and, and what have you, actually pr proved to be the foundation of the company's success. So I think you, <coughs> you know, a certain amount of luck is, 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 is valid. I really don't know why we're bothered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I was just, I was, I was, I was doing this thing called Ice Cream Girls, actually, for ITV, and uh, I hadn't read this. I went into this conversation yesterday, but I was at the read through and I realised I hadn't read that book either, actually. <laughs> the scripts are great. You know, I always read the scripts, but yeah, anyway. Uh, what was the question? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I've lost, the, I've lost the will to live. T Tom, what, what do companies need to do? If they, if they, if they do get you know, old men hitting on them in Soho House, what, 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 what do they need to do to be in a position to actually understand the opportunity? And I, I think it depends on what they want to get out of it. I think, one, um, obviously, when you sell your crystallising value in the business, uh, but two, the partner you're going to work with has got to be taking the company to the next level, and you've got to see that combination you know, making sense. Uh, I think the other fact to, cons to consider is the fact that timing is important. You know, there's no point selling too early because you will get into a, a situation whereby your financial aspirations aren't achieved uh, and you, you may regret doing the deal. So I think it, timing is quite important in terms of making sure that you do the deal at the right time for the right reasons. Okay. And, and uh, I mean, you, you must have found that as well, Magnus, about, about the timing. <coughs> the timing is, is everything. Yeah, yeah it's, it's funny. I think, uh, just picking up on what Andy said, I think... Um, when we set up Firefly, there, there, there just wasn't this the same kind of uh, uh, market for acquisitions that there is now. And I think I think it's really, really important that people don't go, I'm going to set up an indie because I, in three, mm -hmm. five years' time, I'm going to sell it. It's, that's such a bad idea. So although, of course, at a certain point, if you're thinking about it or people are hitting on you in Soho House, um, you obviously need to think about what's going to make you attractive. But... But I think to go get to, to set up a production company with that is a, is a terrible idea. I think you have to do it with a real passion for what you're doing. You can't be driven um, uh, uh, by fi fi no, I mean, financial. It's important. This. I mean, when, we, when Mario and I left Granada, we cut our salaries by about a third, at least two thirds, actually. To, to, you know, we have not paid ourselves that much money over the last five years. We put everything back into the company. The value of the car, everything we sacrificed, I mean, it's a sacrifice, but we gave up your pensions and the <coughs> security and good expenses, all that kind of baloney that you get as part of being an inside an ITV, and put it all in, in, essentially into the value of the company, the rights of the company. So we knew at the end, eventually, whether it be five years or whether it be 10 years, you would have something that was worth something. I, I guess that's what we did know. And, and probably what people don't realise is the length of time it takes to do a deal. It's never, it doesn't happen overnight, and it can have an enormous uh, adverse pressure on, on, on companies. And if, if you're not careful, you can take your eye off the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. I mean, it's just taken six months to, which, which, by, which may seem an incredibly long time, and it certainly does to me, but it actually is quick to selling a company like that. But the process of, of trying to work out who's going to sell their company and meeting lovely people like Tom and, and, and weighing all that up and then sort of thinking about how you, what's the, you know, we put the book together and we get all the things done, go out to market, meet all the companies are interested. I mean, it's a long, old and, and a hard process. And you're really, you know, you have to be thinking very, very long and hard about not just <coughs> what you're doing right now, but what you're going to be doing in the next three to five years. I mean, these, the, these companies that are going to buy you are pretty hard nose. Obviously, the Jameses of the world. I mean, they're looking. They, they're not buying you. They're not going to give you money unless they're bloody sure that they're going to get it back and more. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, this is a proper old business game, and to pretend otherwise is daft. You know. I mean, as a young man who sit on some companies in Soho House, mm -hmm. as you are talking about, I mean, it's very getting very ageist this way. You know, uh, you're young what's, uh, men, in the, you men in the you know fifty-ish is it's all cool. You know, is it? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm coming to terms with it, Andy. <laughs> I mean, I know it was a long time ago for you, but I'm, I haven't got there yet. But, uh, I mean, did you have to kiss many uh, frogs before you um, met your princess? With uh, no, I think we, we were quite focused on... Because we wanted... 
a specific size and a, a specific type of company, I think it, it was pretty easy for us to, to focus down on a, on a small number of companies. I think the most important thing on both sides is the chemistry. I think if you go into something thinking it's going to be a kind of an unbelievable commercial success and great for everybody, that's fantastic. But if you find six months <coughs> down the track that you can't stand the people you work with, you, you, you're not a good fit with the group, you don't really want to be part of the group and you're not going to participate, that's a huge problem. And I think that's the thing that we're probably most nervous about moving forward is for the sake of some company that's fantastic and is doing great stuff, if, they, if it's the wrong chemistry and they're not going to build relationships within the group and with our distribution companies, then it's not going to be worth that. So, you know, I, I, my main advice on this is make sure the chemistry is right between you and the partner that you're going to work with. And obviously, I can see the two of you are going to have a, a fantastic time. Magnus? <laughs> 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 Ma There's Magnus, still time. Do, 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 do you think <laughs> it'll be all right? <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to open this up to, to questions from the floor here. I don't know if we, we've, we've got any <coughs> questions from the floor. If we can just turn the lights up. It clearly... Clearly not. No, no one was. Well, Beryl must have something to say, well, surely. Without a session without complete without I, Beryl. I, I love I love the fact that Beryl Virtue, who has run <laughs> the most successful I independent production company in the country for so long, is here apparently looking for advice, Beryl. I, I, I cannot believe it. <laughs> it's the best family <laughs> business in town. This gentleman here has got has got a question. Can we can we have we got a microphone? So if you just say who you are and uh... Yeah, um, my name's Krish Majumdar. I've just set up my own independent production company. Well done. Um, what does the panel think about Sky's decision to acquire Parthenon and uh, a distribution arm? And how would that affect their companies and their relationship with Sky? Would they <coughs> expect Sky to take their distribution rights? James? Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. I'm not completely clear on what their, you know, what their long-term plans are, and we haven't yet had a conversation, uh, you know, about properties that we're developing with them and where that's going to go. I think it's a, you know, probably <coughs> for, you know, uh, Wayne and I, it's it's a it's something that we need to really get our heads around because rights control and rights ownership is a completely key part of our business moving forward. Um, and, uh, you know, it, uh, genuinely, I think we need, to, we need to really drill down and understand more about, you know, what their rationale is for it. I mean, it's pretty obvious what the rationale is in the long term. But I, I'm not yet sure how that's going to pan out when they want to work with companies who've got distribution partners in place. <coughs> because, you know, the natural uh, state of affairs is that we're going to want to work very happily with the broadcaster, but we're going to want to retain those rights and move them through our distribution companies. So... You know, it's a big question. It's going to be very interesting. I'd be interested to hear more from Sky about their, uh, you know, their rationale behind it. I mean, your biggest programme is a, a Sky Commission. I mean, this would... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I mean, I can't... I, I, I think James got it right. It's very difficult to comment on it because I don't know the details of it. Uh, Sophie Turner-Lang has a background in sales and distribution, obviously, and they're spending a lot of money and are, as a very commercial organisation, always looking to maximise the amount of money they're investing in. And as their investment increases... They are clearly thinking about how, how best to, to keep the money rolling in. Uh, We've got a question. I think it's John McVeigh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Doctor. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, I think the, the panel's uh, thrown some very interesting points of view about investment, but, but it's a really interesting panel. And uh, Andy started this off about uh, Left Bank set up as an international company. And Wayne, you were at Worldwide, and Firefly and James, you've all got a lot of experience <coughs> about the opportunities internationally, and obviously that's predicated on the UK rights system, we're not going to go into that. What I'm really interested from is the potential for more opportunities internationally, and what do you think the opportunities are for British producers? Uh, anyone want to start off? James? I, I think it's, it's and, and Andy can talk <coughs> about scripted you know, as well, but I think it's very different between scripted and non-scripted. I think in scripted, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital that you build international partnerships these days. I think with uh, all broadcasters paying less in licence fees for key productions, you've got to go out there and do that. And the, hopefully the new tax breaks that are coming in next year are going to help a bit and keep production more in the UK. But 
uh, it's absolutely vital that you go and build strong partnerships in the US. And I, I was very encouraged to hear um, Ted talking yesterday about the investments that uh, Netflix are making. I think there are some very interesting new operations uh, starting to invest in original production in the US. And, uh, you know, I think that's a great opportunity. But we've got to find effective ways of going and engaging and understanding what they want. And that's still quite tricky. I think uh, the US, as I said, I think things like real screen help. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's really tricky to sort of get plugged into that. And, and similarly, I, Wayne did a panel on uh, China yesterday, which was, <coughs> I think was absolutely fascinating. And it was depressing that there were 12 people there. Um, and I think we, you know, all of us have got to actually open our eyes and embrace all of the new market opportunities that are coming along. And understanding China is a really key bit of that. And again, uh, you know, uh, how you do that is, is tricky, but uh, you know, that's, that's a key component. So yeah, I think we've all got to work hard to really plug into new international opportunities. I, sp I suppose one of the, what, for, for me, one of the key, the key things internationally is um, getting the balance right. Because of course, certainly for us as a company, the, the primary creative relationships are in this country with the broadcasters in this country. And I, I, I think that's likely to remain. Um, and our, I suppose our model internationally is just to, that the creation will always happen here and then we'll look for the opportunities internationally. But there are, of course, other companies who sort of almost have left the UK behind. And, um, and, and, I, and that wouldn't be for me. I mean, I think that... Um, uh, uh, the opportunities, yes, but I think that you have to be quite careful about your focus because any company is only ever going to have a certain number of creative individuals and if one of them is spending all of their time you know, doing um, cable stuff on the east coast of America, that may not be the best business model in the end. I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, you and I have got similar issues, actually. Uh, at Sony, we've got 13 companies around the world and it's about how you maximise the opportunity of that and get your IP, you know, the key IP creating countries are obviously the UK, the US, Holland, perhaps Scandinavia and a few other territories. And it's how you take that content and you maximise that using your network of companies while at the same time looking for them to, to bring stuff back. And, and it's, quite, it's quite a complicated mix, but that's one way of maximising opportunity. And look for, the one thing that we did do it worldwide was think very differently with, with with, with Left Bank about those financial opportunities. You know, we had traditionally used our offices in those countries to work with broadcasters for investment, and we found there was lots of other money that could be accessed in different ways. I mean, that was quite an interesting moment for us, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, it was, yeah. yeah well, there was like the Wallen and Zen, I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And what your question, John, was, what, is it, do we think there's more potential? Is that, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, it's an industry that's bucking the trend, isn't it, the economy? That's the most extraordinary thing. We're all incredibly privileged to be in an industry that somehow at the moment, seems to be hanging on and you know, generally increasing, even if the monies are coming are, 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 are tough uh, for things. So, uh, and, and you've also got the, the, those television markets around the world are expanding exponentially. I mean, I, I didn't realise until I joined Sony that our, our, our reformatted scripted business in Russia, for example, is absolutely astonishing. So we have a production company in Russia who makes has made 400 episodes of Everybody Loves Raymond in Russia. You made me they, agree to go to the Ukraine last night. I, I did. Remember, I you, remember that. Yeah, but that was... That was, <laughs> that was I said I'd go to the Ukraine for a weekend or something. Yeah, it was David Brooks. <laughs> David Brooks. And let's face it, we're, none of us are really going to go there, are we? <laughs> with Brookie. But, but, and, and then we've, 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 got a, we've, got a, we've got a company this, uh, in, in Arabia this week who have, who have in production for Everybody Loves Raymond in Egypt. And, but, but our Russian company, what they've done quite interestingly is they took American scripted expertise and they started a sitcom business in Russia, which didn't exist. And now, after running through Raymond and uh, Married with Children, of course what they want is other formats, other scripted formats, other comedy. And they don't necessarily need uh, 400 American episodes. They'd be quite interested in you know, eight-part British series because now they've got the ability to actually take that with the writers. And I think that's interesting. And the Chinese yesterday were talking very openly about, we don't kind of get a lot of it. You guys are the world leaders, actually, and work with us, which I thought was, was really interesting, yeah. actually. And, and I'd recommend that there's a... 3.30 this afternoon. 3.30 this afternoon. Three, yeah. this afternoon go and meet them. There's, what was amazing yesterday, we had this session, and there is a guy who is the second most important person in CCTV, who is the Chinese state broadcaster. He is, by a quantum, the most important media person at this conference at the moment. 
it's quite astonishing. Um, In terms of, of tackling those new emerging markets, would you pluck people out and set up a new Sony subsidiary there, or would you look to buy a company? Or is that depends? I, th I think this is one, one of the questions you have when you, when you develop and grow in international businesses, and I certainly, you know, I've seen this in somewhere else I've worked, is the cultural differences and understanding the market. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's difficult enough in Britain to spot really great talent who have the ability to be <coughs> a uh, creative entrepreneur, to mm. run a company, pitch, develop, and, and so on. To do that in a foreign country where you probably don't know the environment is even more difficult. So I think you would probably look for an existing company mm. and do a tremendous amount of due diligence yeah. on them, really. Uh, it's quite, I don't know if you find that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think understanding Europe, fine, the US can understand. I think we're taking very careful steps when we're looking at yeah. Asia and looking at China and, and just understanding it. And, and, and partnerships is probably the way. Yeah. I mean, w one thing you do realise that actually the American collaborative approach of studios in which they work with quite a lot of people is actually probably the way you're really going to understand markets in South America, Southeast Asia and, and, and so on. Have we got any other, any other questions? <coughs> no? No one else? Okay, um, what I would like you guys to do is, is a sort of, as a nice op sum, give one piece of advice to any independent producer. I'm going to start with you, Magnus. I, I think it's probably the advice I've, I've already given is, is that don't, I mean, this, is, this, this panel has obviously been partly about how you make the most of kind of commercial opportunities. Um, but I think that if you're starting up an independent production company or running one, it, it's absolutely got to be driven by um, a love of what you do. And, and, and obviously business is important. It's important to be um, sensible about how you run your company, but don't, don't leave that, but don't leave the kind of creative drive and excitement behind because you've got your eye on a commercial um, goal. Okay, James? Um, work with people that you like and you want to work with. Don't just work with people because you think you're going to make lots of money out of it. Uh, life's too short to work with people you don't like and you don't want to spend time with. I think from a strategic perspective, it's to think about America. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Only a few of the UK Indies have, have managed to tap into that marketplace. Huge number of channels, huge commission opportunities and, and opportunities for growth, I think. So I would, I would, for those Indies that are of a sufficient scale, to start thinking about the US. Okay, and Andy? Well, it's, it's the same, really. Keep it, you know, be clear, keep it tight, watch your cash flow. Um, I, I, I should have apologised at the beginning that we are an all-male panel. Uh, um, I, I'm sorry about that in the, in the Glasnos uh, post-Murdoch era. We, we, we um, contractually obliged to say that. But I hope you... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope you agree it's been, I, I think, really interesting and fascinating, and I'm sure uh, later on... If, if you want to talk to any of the guys, I'd be more than happy to give uh, advice. But uh, I'd like you to show your appreciation to our panelists. Thank you.